So, Rick, can you tell us about the laboratories here, just for people who don't understand or no. Okay, this is Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and the tradition of this laboratory was originally nuclear physics. Uh, was in, the cyclotron was invented here. Oh, was and, it invented here? Oh, yes. Like yes, and Ernest Lawrence invented it here and uh, was the pioneer. This is the pioneer laboratory in the United States for oh, okay. uh, of national laboratories. They created the idea of a national laboratory right, here. Right. And so the cyclotron here has been running for well over 50 years now. Uh, it's not the same cyclotron as it was to begin with. They have many, many capabilities they didn't have before. Okay. And people do basic physics research. People do uh, research on the... Uh, upsets of electronics by cosmic rays here okay. and, and, and I do nuclear physics research here and then around the world because nuclear physicists travel a lot. We, we do things everywhere, uh, and, many facilities. And your specialty has been the study of isotopes, I understand. Is that right? Yes, right? yes. I, I wrote the book called The Table of Isotopes, which is actually the eighth edition of this book. The first one was okay. written by Glenn Seaborg, the Nobel Prize winner, who, who discovered plutonium. Okay. And uh, he wrote the first book in 1940, and I wrote the last book in 1996. So if anyone wants to know about uh, isotopes of carbon for carbon dating or oxygen 18, you're the right. guy we should right. be asking. Right. So my book is used by archaeologists, chemists, physicists, engineers, all kinds of people. It's, it's just very widely used. So along the line, you got interested in some of the archaeology uh, uh, archaeological discoveries. Yes. People were coming to you and saying, "What's this all mean?" Uh, Rick? Yes, yes. So I got interested in, in archaeology in particular when somebody brought me, Bill Topping, to be particular, brought me some samples from uh, Michigan from the Ganey and, and Clovis is, is site. Bill from around this area. He's part of Berkeley, or no, no. Bill is from the University of Michigan, where oh, I okay. happened to graduate. Oh, that's right. Sixty-seven. Uh, he, all right. Yeah. yeah, I graduated sixty-seven, and he graduated sometime after that. Uh, he uh, was doing archaeological work at the, at the Clovis site where the Ganey Clovis Point was named after. Right. And that site no longer can be visited because they've since buried it over. But in that site he found uh, some evidence of radioactivity at a certain level as well as the site looked very strange compared to the rest of the landscape okay. as, as if it had been blasted or something. Uh, and just before we go on, most people are assuming that the Clovis Indian culture died out around 12, 13,000 years ago. Right, right. Now we know that because there's no more Clovis points. It just ended, isn't yes. it? Yes. Now we don't have very many bones from those people, and we don't know much about what those people might have looked like. For all we know, they're Europeans. Uh, we really have no way of telling, you know, what these original people were, but we do know that their uh, their their tools, their their large uh, spear points that they used to yeah. hunt the large animals, uh, and these disappeared flints, almost flints. instantaneously. Yes, and these were flints. Yes, and I bring that up because one of the first discoveries was that there were embeddings. If I got that right, in these flints, you did, uh, he discovered, Bill Topping discovered. Yes, he, within some of the flint chips. Because yeah. this was, this Ganey site was a place where they manufactured the uh, larger spear points and other arrow points and things yeah. like that. He found the the scraps in the in near the fire pit where they worked on these things, and inside of these, he found evidence that they had been bombarded by something. There were particle tracks in them, cosmic ray tracks in them, which we later compared with experiments where we could make the equivalent of a cosmic ray in an and an accelerator. in fact, didn't you get the, them in a cyclotron and bombard them with yes. atomic particles? Yes. And they produce very similar yes. uh, embeddings, if you want a better word, iron spirals at the bottom? Of yes. Them, right? Yes. And, and so Topping found these, and, and we indeed, indeed did find uh, evidence that they had been bombarded by, uh, by something, by cosmic rays, most likely. Uh, and so where did he and you go on from there? What happened next in this story? Okay, so he sent me samples from this site to analyze. And in these samples, we found evidence of uh, iron particles just in a very narrow layer at the time that this site at the level of the site where it was okay, dug, yeah. and we found evidence associated with it that there was also radioactivity in this one area, and it was as if there was a very strange impact layer there. Okay. And I did uh, chemical analysis of uh, of the sediment from this and, and found uh, 
that it was rich in titanium and there were many other things in there. That was a very unusual collection of and materials. And I think at the time, just reading some of your books, it no yeah. way could be related to any, uh, let's say, nuclear explosion experiments. So it was something no. quite unique. Yeah, it, it appeared to be something quite unique. And we didn't have a lot of data, but we had this one site. Now, Topping wasn't uh, in a position to go traveling around the country. And so we published a small paper in, in, a, in a small journal, and uh, the Mammoth Trumpet, and oh, yeah. that described what we had found up to that point. And it appeared that it had been caused by some kind of cosmic event, but we really didn't know what it was. And then, about two years later, I met another collaborator, Alan West, from Arizona, yeah. who had the ability and the funds to travel and collect more samples. He was retired and able to work full time on this project. Well, retirees seem to get the most work done. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He wasn't encumbered by anything else. And so he, uh, he started going to other sites and found similar information and more information. And so at these other sites, uh, he started doing more and more detailed analysis, and he found that each of these sites, which were already dated by the archaeologists, yeah. uh, there were 13,000-year-old uh, uh, metallic microspherals, 50 micrometers in diameter. Uh, and when, we were talking, when, when you say metallic, are we talking about iron? We're talking about... Well, the, it was mostly iron and titanium. The titanium okay. is a very unusual composition. Oh, okay. yeah. But they were, they were very round spherules, and you don't find these in the other layers of sediment. Okay. So they were peaking just at this one date, as if they'd been deposited there at this one time. Yeah. Okay. And we also found carbon spherules, uh, which were millimeter di diameter size spherules, which oh, so they're quite large compared to the iron. Quite large compared to the metallic spherules. Yep. Yep. And the carbon spherules, if you cut them open, were vesicular. They had many little cells in them. Okay, and, th and this is where the nano diamonds start to come in, or? Well, later on, when we, 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 we searched for the nano diamonds, because that would be a clear indicator of an impact event, because they are produced in impacts. Uh, we did find nanodiamonds inside these carbon spherules. And literally one of those millimeter carbon spherules might have millions of nanodiamonds in them. Oh, okay. But of course, those are nanometer size. They're very, very tiny. Yeah, right. And so we've got to get the different yes. sizes, like the carbons were that big, yes. the little miniature nanodiamonds inside, and the miniature iron spherules as well. Is that right? Right. right. Okay, so where do we go from there, Rick? I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Okay. Okay, so Alan found this stuff in several sites in the southwest, in several sites in Canada, and then he went to a place called the Carolina Bays, ah. and the Carolina Bays had long been uh, associated with impacts until in recent times people could not find the meteorites, so they were looking for other and solutions. And if I can go into uh, those who don't know the Carolina Bays, <laughs> yeah. it's all right for Americans, everyone knows the Carolina Well, actually, nobody knows the Carolina Bays. <laughs> well, it turns true. out even the people in the Carolinas don't know them because yeah, they're not yeah. visible from yeah. the ground. It's only when you look on Google Earth you see That's right. These hundreds of little round yes. circles yes. Uh, all around river beds and things like yes. that. But they're, they, they're very size. What size is roughly we're talking about here? Well, they vary from uh, 5, 10 kilometers down to uh, 100 meters, maybe, uh, or even less. And there's less. literally thousands across that corner of the U.S., isn't there? Well, there's probably at least 500,000. Wow. Maybe more. And they go up and down the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Nobody was aware of these until the 1930s when aerial photography yeah. started. And then they saw them from the airplanes because you they're so shallow that you don't see them from the ground yeah. in the proper perspective. But they're all elliptical with axes that are parallel to each other. And they're all raised on one side, apparently. Yes, they? yes. They have a lip on one side. I, As if something came along, scooped them out. And sometimes there was one on top of another on top of another, as if a giant quite, came walking it's through. It's amazing. And I yeah. find this interesting because yeah. in Australia there's something similar uh -huh. along the Murray River and the Darling River at Lake uh -huh. Victoria, uh -huh. the Nindy Lakes and Lake yeah. Mungo. But anyway, I'm interrupting your stories. Yes, no, that's okay. And, and so the, there was a big mystery about what the formation of the Carolina Bays was. But one of the things that had been pointed out by the earliest uh, people that studied it is that they all pointed towards the Great Lakes, towards this Michigan site, okay. except for a few that pointed towards Hudson Bay. So if you went north or south, the, the axis shifted slightly. 
as if they were all pointing towards some event that happened far away. Okay. Yeah. And so our hypothesis became that these were uh, formed by the shock wave, the wind that followed a large impact. Okay. And so that actually coincides with the most prevalent current theory that they were formed by a substantial windstorm of some kind. Okay, okay. So actually the people who don't believe that there might be an impact still believe there was a wind. Okay, and a very so unusual a wind from an unusual direction. Right, right, yeah. right. So we, uh, we excavated the Carolina Bays and we found the same things that we found at all these other sites which were found in only a centimeter or two of, of sediment out of the okay. entire depth of the site in the Carolina Bays, which were, you know, meters in depth, we would find it distributed throughout the bays as if something had come through and mixed all this stuff together and stuffed it in there. And if you go look through the bays, you find the same impact material, which you only find in a narrow layer, throughout the bays. But if you go between bays, it's narrow again. Ah, oh, okay. So yes. whatever happened, happened uh, more radically at that particular point where the bays were formed and yeah. in between, it was let's say a less effect anyway but that's right so you know so the, between the bays it was just a thin layer like we found in the rest of the country but in these bays it was clear that they had been formed and mixed with this stuff at the same time okay they were very mixed now of course some of that mixing could have occurred even afterwards if they were shifting sands in there or something like yeah, that sure and later on we have found evidence of some other bays in Kansas and Nebraska and possibly Texas that also point towards the Great Lakes. Right. They're shallower features that are a little harder to see, but you can see them. And some of our papers, we actually show those as well. Okay, so you got this mounting body of evidence. So what yeah. happened next then, if you like? Okay, so we pulled together all of this evidence from many sites, and, and it was all consistent. And the chemistry, the analysis of the material, the meta metallic material that we found in these layers and other material was consistent. They were always the same and different from the surrounding sediments. Uh, we, we came to a hypothesis that there must have been an impact in somewhere near Michigan that had created all of these things, at least one impact, maybe more. And so we also found, I should mention, that these metallic spherules were rich in water. They normally impact spherules, spherules that come from outer space all the time. There are, there are, there are cosmic spherules coming in at a, at a low rate all the time that they find in Antarctica. Uh, when they go through and look through a lot of ice yeah. and, and melt it, they'll find a few of these. Uh, those don't contain any water to speak of, but these contain significant amounts of water, which make us, made us think that they were formed in a steam environment. Oh, well, and so. So that gave us a clue that they were probably formed in, the, uh, in an impact into the ice, into the ice sheet. Well, it turns out that the timing of the disappearance of the megafauna in North America is coincidence with the timing of the failure of the Laurentide ice sheet in the beginning yeah. of the Younger Dryas cooling period, a period of about 1,300 years, and where again, temperatures dropped about 10, 12 and degrees. we're again talking about 13,000, 12,000 years yeah, ago. Yeah, as far as we can tell within the measurement error, these things all happened simultaneously. Yeah. The mammoths were gone, the other large animals were gone, and you could explain it all by an impact. Okay. And I should also mention that in many of the sites there was a black mat. Well, just stop there a second. Okay. Now, I heard you talking, uh, because we do look at other things, about yeah. this black mat. And so people don't get it wrong, it's not necessarily a black mat. There's the many different materials, is that right? Or? Well, that's right. The black mat itself, which isn't every site. Yeah. It's in sites that were probably wet at that time. The black mat appears to have to be in part an algal mat, but it also contains burned material probably. Okay, so it's a vegetative charcoal. patch as well. Yes, it, it's a mixture of things. And it starts out as a very dark black mat, yeah. and then it gets progressively lighter over the next thousand years of deposition as if things continued to come in uh, afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And this black mat was, I think, discovered by Vance Haynes, University of Arizona, at some of the sites, in fact, Vance Haynes took us to the Murray Springs site, for example, okay. as uh, and, and, and gave us the permission to dig there. And he had observed, well before we had done any of this, that this black mat is a demarcation line. Okay. There are no evidence of mammoths, horses, any other megafauna above or within the black mat. And this is a really important point. That's right. We're talking about extinction here, yes. is that right? Yes. 
so it, it's clear it's like the uh, iridium layer in the KT. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing above it anymore. Okay. And so in, in virtually all of these animals must have disappeared at that time. And, and as Vance Haynes explains, it, it's as if it happened in an instant. Yeah. All of the megafauna.